Today, my featured guest is Daryl Thomas, and he is a lifelong Christian, raised Methodist, and currently a member of a non-denominational church called Forest Hill. He's been married to his beloved bride, Ingrid, for just under 18 years, and they each have a daughter from a previous relationship who are both age, ni- age 29. Age 29. Uh, Daryl has owned his small business for just over 27 years, which he runs with his wife and daughter, a family business. Hey, there's pros and cons to that. I'm sure we're going to get into that startup nation. He started this business at the lowest point in his life. You ready? With no place to live, one change of clothes, his car, a half tank of gas, and $35 to his name. Today, that same business, Carpet Pros, is the largest non-franchise carpet and area rug cleaning company in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. What a huge success story we have right here. He's running a seven-figure business from $35 to seven figures. Startup Nation, Daryl wrote the book, An Excellent Life, to help you be able to find what God has in store for you and to reach your full potential within God's plan for your life. Some of you have no idea what God's plan is for your life, mostly because you don't know how to find out, how to ask him. What are the words you need to say? What's the time you need to give to spending with him in order to find that out? There's so much confusion around this topic in the Christian space. So hopefully we're going to clear some of that out by finding out how Daryl did it and got very clear on God's plan for his life, where he was able to then receive God's increase in his business and in his family. So Daryl Thomas, welcome to your first 100K Top 100 podcast in entrepreneurship. Go ahead and fill in some of the gaps in that intro, would you? Wow, Warren, thank you. Good to be with you. And um, I really appreciate your, your inviting me to be here with you. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's uh, a, a bio that I used to be, as, and I'm sure many can identify with this, not wanting to share. Um, the background to that, I had always been successful. I'd always done very well. And and um, I entered a time in my life when I was investing in real estate. I was married at the time. And I went from almost seven figures net worth in the late uh, 80s, early 90s to uh, having that taken away in a series of steps that only took a couple of months. Hmm. So um, my my background is in, is in sales, it's in the, in the automobile business. Um, and so uh, I morphed that into real estate. And then when, when that was gone, and uh, I'm basically left with with very little money, um, not really knowing what direction to take. I literally just got in my car, drove down to to Daytona Beach, and sat on the beach for a month. I stayed in a hostel just to just to have people around me, but not really, you know, just peripheral people. And it was shocking to me the people that I got to know in that experience. Almost all of them homeless, sleeping on the on the beach at night. Um, not knowing where their next meal is coming from. I wasn't at that point at that moment. There were a few other stones to fall after that. But sitting on that beach, um, not in an audible uh, tone, but God's telling me, look, stand up, go back to Atlanta, which is where I'm from, and get in the carpet cleaning business. Well, that was as foreign to me as, you know, going to the moon. I had no experience with that, had no idea why I was being led in that direction. But that's what I did. I went to work for a company that uh, uh, I knew a little bit about, uh, was with them for about two and a half months. And they moved me from Atlanta to Charlotte, North Carolina to run an office for them. And then three weeks later, the IRS closed them down with everything that I owned, the rest of the money that I had in their office. Now, I don't know if you have any experience negotiating with the IRS over things like that, but uh, they're not willing to negotiate. So uh, I went from having a few thousand dollars down to what I described in my bio, which was no place to live, um, one change of clothes. My car was paid for, fortunately. That was my parting gift from the car business. Uh, but I had $35 and that was it. So what does any entrepreneur do in that situation? Well, uh, with my training, I do instantly do a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. 
And I realized I don't have a lot of choices that don't involve just getting in my car and driving back to Atlanta and maybe living with my parents, which was for me, not acceptable. So what does any entrepreneur do with $35? I started the business. And it's interesting because how do you do that? I didn't have any equipment, uh, but there started a series of small things that God put in my way or in, in, uh, steps for me to take that just led for this to happen in a very gradual and almost satisfying way. Um, I don't know how many have been in this situation that I was, but I didn't view it like this is some giant catastrophe. I instinctively understood that I'm in the position that I am because of choices and decisions that I had made for better or for worse. You don't always understand that. But um, basically what I did was to say, okay, this is what I have. How can I get from A to B? Um, one thing that I did when I decided to get in the business, which was that day, I went to a company that sold pagers. This is back in 1995. Mm -hmm. And I realized I can't even afford a pager. I can only get a phone number. So that was about, say, $17.50. And then I was going to uh, get some flyers. I go to Kinko's. Remember Kinko's? And I'm going to have some flyers made. And they, the template that it would take uh, cost more than the flyers that I was going to print. I don't have a template. So I literally made a, a flyer from an old Yellow Pages phone book. It looked like a ransom note. <laughs> and uh, what I've left out is I happened to run into somebody who was willing to lend me equipment for a little while that I could buy from them. So I, I had those flyers made and just putting one step and one foot in front of the other, I I basically started my business. And, uh, you know, living in your car and uh, doing that kind of work, you have a razor thin air uh, margin of error. You have no room for error. Um, I didn't have any expenses in my life other than just very basic ones. I just needed to be able to eat and things like this, put gas in the car and move forward every day. But I, at the same time that I felt like um, this is a horrible thing and this, these kind of issues, I, I never felt panicked. I never felt alone. I never felt distressed. I simply knew that if I keep, uh, keep my focus where it should be, keep my focus on God and uh, just be willing to listen which is easy to do sometimes and impossible to do in other times, right? Uh, but I was intent on listening. And um, there's something I have to learn. I must have said that to myself thousands of times. And I was very willing to learn those lessons, uh, be humbled. Um, maybe I was arrogant. Maybe I was prideful. Maybe I took things for granted. Not after that. Um, it took a while to be able to just, I think I actually waited till I had about $5,000 to allow myself to sleep indoors. So that was, um, that was an interesting time. The people that I got to know, the other thing I didn't add to it, I didn't know anybody in Charlotte. I've been there three weeks, been here three weeks. So I, I had no friends. I had no acquaintances. I didn't know anybody here. So it was, it was a journey, but uh, it was one that uh, for some odd reason, I had an amazing amount of peace with. So, and I think that was to my, greatly to my benefit because there was no panic. There was no, um, there was no frustration, any of that. I just knew I have to be patient. Mm. Startup Nation, Daryl jumped right into his story. I mean, like we just went like into the deep end of the pool there. <laughs> and uh, I mean, what, a, what am I going to say here? I mean, this is God. Right. This is God showing up in Daryl's life, right? And a few things we could take away from this story is that, you know, when Daryl entered an unexpected storm in his life, financial ruin, my wife corrects me, ruined, ruin, it's two syllables, honey, two <laughs> syllables. Um, you know, as he entered this, one, he didn't cry out why god why 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 and play a victim but instead he asked what what am i meant to learn from this there's a lesson here what is it where am i being grown what am i being asked to do where am i being led to right and that was very specific from god north charlotte north carolina start a carpet business uh, now, for some of us listening right now, maybe we've never heard from God with that kind of clarity and specificity. Um, 
but it is possible. And I've heard from God that, like, go buy a radio station, which I did just recently. I was telling wow. Daryl and uh, didn't want a radio station, but now I own a radio station here in Tampa. Uh, but if you're listening, you know, that's that's the first thing I want to just highlight in Daryl's story is that he immediately, when, when the storm's happening, he did what I highly recommend. And that is he went and took time away from all the chaos, all the noise, and he sought God. He pursued God. He just sat right for a month on a beach listening to God. And there, not only did he meet God, hear God, and get direction, but he also got to meet all these wonderful people that maybe he hadn't met before and hear all their stories of their hurts, their wounds, their trials, their brokenness, and maybe gain perspective that, hey, they have it worse than he does, maybe even at, at that time, uh, you know, at the bottom of the pit. So that's the first thing I think we take away from Daryl's story. Um, Daryl, like, I got to ask you, like your personal life, right? That's your business life mm -hmm. and everything. But like your personal life, what was going on there? I mean, did you have a wife? Did you have kids? Like, how did you live in your car by yourself? Yeah, well, I was divorced. Uh, my uh, my daughter was two years old. The day that the IRS seized this business that I worked for was my daughter's second birthday, uh, August 9th, 1995. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll never forget the date of that because of that. But uh, she lived with her mom in, in Greenville, South Carolina. Part of the reason I agreed to move to Charlotte from Atlanta was because it was 50 miles closer one way to see my daughter. Mm. So I, uh, while I, at the time, it was very difficult um, not being with my daughter every day. I had that happen anyway. So in some ways, it was a benefit, just like you say, you, you can't live in your car with a family, right? So I was, I was very single, and um, whatever I did was just, it was just me. So mm. I was able to see her more because I had no other uh, encumbrances. I was just focused on work and taking care of her. The only real bill that I had was, um, besides day-to-day -day needs, was just child support. So taking care of my daughter, which I, I very much did. And, um, and she works for me today and has for many, many years. So that's, uh, that's quite a blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, she literally grew up in this business, watching me do it. And when she actually started working for us, I'm amazed that she knows how to do all this. And she's like, well, I've been watching you since I was two. So it was, um, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's uh, quite a blessing to uh, you have, you have a small child and you, you worry for them and you, you, you pray for them and, and in the middle of all that, they somehow magically watch what you do. And I was always very aware of that. Um, you know, just never what you tell them is always what you show them. And mm -hmm. um, she's grown up to be an amazing, uh, unbelievably good and gifted young lady. Mm, that's I'm very so proud beautiful. Of her. Yeah. All right. So Startup Nation, before we unpack uh, the strategies uh, and, and tactics that Daryl used to uh, go from $35 to making his first six figures and beyond. Uh, I like to get it a little bit into the mental game um, that many of us go through uh, as entrepreneurs, especially when we lose everything. And I remember when I was in my 20s when I lost you know, my seven-figure business mm -hmm. and I crashed and burned um, not just financially, but emotionally and psychologically as well. And I got so much head trash from that. Mm -hmm. And I just remember feeling like a failure, a total failure. I mean, I had a team of 50 people that reported to me every day and I'm making the mm -hmm. money and then it's gone. It's gone. And I did end up moving back and moving in with my mother back in New York for a spell until I built my next business um, just to get back on my feet. But the entire time I was just feeling like I'm a failure. Wow. And I even started to believe that that success I just had um, was a fluke. I got lucky. You know, I'm an imposter. How right. did you not go there? 
that almost seems like a normal expected response for so many entrepreneurs that I've had on my show. Right. What, what protected your mind where you're like, Hey, I was calm. I was peaceful. I wasn't stressed. I just knew there was a lesson and let me do what's in front of me. How'd you do that? Seriously. Right. Well, I always grew up in the church. Uh, as, uh, as we spoke earlier, I grew up Methodist and um, very involved in the church. Uh, so I had that foundation. And I think it's interesting when people grow up in the church that typically they have a time in their life where they they either take it totally for granted, um, they treat it more as, as a social aspect of their life rather than a personal relationship with Christ as it should be. But um, And I went through that because uh, I was in the car business for many years and Gosh, when I got in it, we closed early on Saturdays and we're certainly closed on Sundays. And when I, uh, after a few years, we were open seven days a week and, you know, working 12 hours a day. I think I went at one point uh, 11 or 12 months without a day off, this kind of thing. So we rationalize to ourselves why that's okay. Mm. And we justify all the reasons that, uh, that we can do it. And of course, we're just lying to ourselves and we're lying to, to God at the same time. But I, I always had that foundation. And another major benefit of mine, I had um, growing up great coaches, great godly coaches, uh, certain people in my life, the youth program we had at our church, the MYF program, the adults in my life when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, they taught us about life. Most kids learn about uh, uh, the evils of life from their friends. Well, what a horrible place to learn that. You know, you're learning about how to live life from some other idiot that, that doesn't know how to live life. But we were fortunate to have adults in our lives at that time, at least for me, they taught us what the psychology of what's going on when a kid offers you a, a beer or when the subject of sex comes up with a, with a girl, how to handle those circumstances and situations. Let me put it like this. The first three girlfriends that I had broke up with me because I wouldn't have sex with them. Mm. So I had that type of foundation. Maybe some of that was fear. You know, what's going to happen if I, if I mess up, how are people going to view me? So, but, uh, but beyond that, I just knew those things were wrong and they were certainly bad for me. So I stayed away from things like that. Another benefit I had was uh, very early on being exposed to people like Zig Ziglar, uh, Brian Tracy, all of those guys. And um, I don't know if you've, uh, I, I sent you a copy of the book, don't know if you got it, but the, um, the uh, Ford is written by Tom Ziegler, Zig's son, which was um, quite gratifying for me when he, to, when he agreed to do that. I mean, um, I was quite humbled. So, mm -hmm. but um, being exposed to people like that, that are godly men anyway, Zig Ziglar is a wonderful, uh, amazing businessman and motivational speaker but what most people don't know about him is his his total commitment to jesus christ and building his life around him so that's what i that's my foundation and i just drew on those experiences uh, i instinctively knew that uh whatever i'm going through because i had belief in myself but i also had belief in the gifts that god had given me that uh, this isn't the end this isn't something that's going to further trip me up i didn't have i don't have addictions i don't have any of those things that, that, that pull most people away uh, and thank God for that. So all I had was a strong mind, a strong body and a strong will and, and a lot of faith. So I think that was what brought me through that. And I almost treated it like um, this is pre-reality show, right? But I almost treated it like, okay, I'm just figuring out how to get off the island. And I, I almost made a game of it. When you're sleeping in your car and in parking lots, right? and things like this you have to make a game of it or you will go crazy so i um i just had fun with it you know and i purposely stayed in that circumstance a little bit longer than i than i had to just because i wanted to have an even stronger foundation once i started moving forward and, and buying things that i needed for the business so i just stayed as conservative as i possibly could um, any spare time that i had i would go to the public library and check out and read books on, on motivation, on, uh, on Christ, and just anything that I could get that was positive and uplifting. At that point, I knew I could not allow the negatives to creep in. So I just totally immersed myself. Uh, you have, you know, the term total immersion. I was either working, sleeping, or, or, or reading at that time. Um, mm. 
I bought when I could uh, cassette tapes, DVDs, I'm sorry, CDs. Uh, so I'm constantly listening to motivational, uplifting material. Uh, in the middle of that, I get to meet people uh, that were, um, it seems like this is somebody I was supposed to meet at this time, just the right person with the right inspiration at the right time. All along the way, everything just kept moving just a little bit forward. And you, you know the expression, uh, two steps forward, one step back. I never experienced that. Every single event was was a step forward, incrementally small, but it was another step forward, another brick in the wall and building towards uh, what I was uh, trying to do. And um, I'm convinced, though, this may sound odd to you, that the reason God told me to get into the carpet cleaning business didn't have anything to do with the carpet cleaning business. I think he knew that it would bring me to two relationships. Uh, one of those is Tom, but beyond that, a gentleman named Howard Partridge, who is the small business coach for Ziegler, uh, and my wife. I met her. She was a customer. That's how we met. No Odd way. Oddly, she was a referral from her ex-in-laws. Wow. It's like, I just picture it, you know, Hey, how you doing? You want me right. to clean these carpets for you? <laughs> huh? Look yeah. at that. Boom. Well, they're married. Right. So I'm going to try to impress you here that I met her 20 years, nine months and 27 days ago. That was a pretty good day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So much here. So much, Daryl, you know, Startup Nation, a very, very crucial lesson I hope you take away from what Daryl just shared is that when you're down at the bottom and you're in the pit, you must preserve and protect your mind, your thoughts. You must take every thought captive in Jesus. You must put a shield around your head to not let in the poison and the lies and the doubts because all the external evidence around you is telling you the opposite of what God has planned for you. So you must have positive thoughts being put in. And Daryl did something that I think is exactly correct. Is he went and he filled his mind with only good things, as St. Paul tells us, right? Think of good things. Think of encouraging things, pure things, beautiful things. Like only these things let in, especially when you're going through a storm in your life, a trial, a struggle. This is, this is so important. And Daryl, I get it. I get it. I've done it many times myself. And even today, I look at, like, if I lost everything tomorrow, you know, they asked all the very successful people, if you lost everything tomorrow, what would you do? Like, you're homeless, you're on the street, right? I'm like, I literally would spend all my time in two places. Two places. The first place is at the local church, just sitting silently with God, with a pen and paper. And, and literally taking my marching orders for the day from him or for the week. And I've done it before and it served me well. And then the second place I would be, Daryl, is at the local library. Just reading and filling my mind with good things. And as a taxpayer with a library card, did you know that your local library has to order any book you request? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, free of charge. They have to no do joke. it. Yeah, yeah, that's what the taxpayer dollars go for. So if you see your local library with all this, you know, really bad type of content and books and all of a sudden God's being pushed out, did you know people? You could go there and be like, hey, I want you to order this book, this book, this book, this book, and this book from all these Christian authors. And they have to do it. Wow. Yeah, isn't that cool? My dad used to do this. Sorry for the side note. But he used to go to wow. the local libraries and order free of charge they would have to order Bibles and children's Christian books and everything that whatever he requested. And he would get them all the shelves stocked with good things because there was pretty much just poison left in these libraries. Wow. Isn't that cool? No, I had no idea that, uh, that gives me a few ideas. Yeah. Right. Doesn't it? <laughs> all right, people read your public libraries. You heard it here on your first 100 K bring good things in. Yeah, but, really but here's is. the point. Like, Man, if you're going through tough times, those are two great places. 
time with God and time with at the library, just filling your, your mind with good things. Daryl, let's get into business here, man. Come on. Startup Nation's been so patient. They're like, what's the tips? What's the strategy? I got my thoughts right, Daryl. I just need good <clears throat> plan, a good plan. I need a good business model. What am I missing, Daryl? All right, Daryl. So, like, you got your $35. You spend it. Mm -hmm. You print out the flyers, the carpet business. You borrow some equipment from someone. What is your very f next three steps, next three moves that you did to get clients, to get clients? Yeah. yeah. I think I had 250 flyers. Um, I received three phone calls the following day from those 250 flyers. Two were hangups. And one was a guy named Timothy Allen Davis. I'll never forget him. Um my very first customer, I cleaned his place and then I cleaned a friend of his in the same day. I made like $200, you know, when you have, <laughs> at that time I had like eight cents in my pocket. That's big money, and baby. It, Where it did you was, hang those flyers? Uh, I just put them on in mailboxes in a community that was really close to where I was uh, parking my Camry. <laughs> <laughs> Toyota Camry, old reliable. So, and and to uh, not waste any gas, I would walk to put them out, right? Okay. And um, you want to talk about praying over something. Uh, try praying over where to put those flyers. Hmm. If I had not gotten that one phone call from a guy that does not know how important that was, um, we're talking a totally different story right now. So what totally did you different. do? What did that look like, praying over the neighborhood or, or where to place the flyers? Like yeah. walk us through that because take okay. us to the basics. We A lot of us don't know how to pray specifically. Right. Well, and that's an important thing. Um, I didn't pray, um, God, you know, let my phone ring off the hook. I just prayed, let your will be done. If I'm supposed to do this, then you need to provide the way. That was it. Startup Nation, did you hear that language? God, if you want me to do this over here, then you need to do this over here. I've had very similar language in my prayers about this radio station. I'm like, mm -hmm. God, I know nothing about radio. I don't want to do this. You had me write a big check for this thing. Are you kidding me? You need to now provide me people who know radio, who are going to mentor me free of charge and help me build this thing. Like literally there's a part. In, in this, a participation. So your participation always first, Startup Nation, is obedience. That's your participation. But right. provision comes from God, not from you. That's very important. Please continue, Daryl. Well, I put out the flyers within the next 12 or, uh, or so hours the following morning. Uh, got the phone call, scheduled the appointment. And I think the biggest sales job I've ever done was getting that guy to do it that day not next week. There was no next week. It was mm -hmm. today. I was down to, I don't know. I, I didn't have enough to go anywhere. I didn't have enough gas to go anywhere, but just this local little area because of the running around I had to do with a half tank of gas to go to, to, to the, the company I bought the, the phone number from to Kinko's mm -hmm. and all this. I was down to change and fumes. Mm -hmm. So specific location to put out the flyers, um, making the choice to walk, not drive, because I would have been out of gas. Um, so that job came through. He ended up uh, taking me to a friend's house to clean that, had $200. Um, and then you want to talk about praying again. I have $200. How do I spend this money? Oh, that's interesting. How do I spend this money? I have $200. So um, I think I literally prayed over that an entire evening. Just how do I spend this money? Uh, keep in mind, I still don't own any equipment. I don't actually have, um, I mean, I'm, I'm buying the supplies that I need uh, to clean with at the local grocery store, the rug doctor stuff, which is comparative to what we buy now is was, was uh, not very good quality and expensive. So how do I spend this money? So I was, um, one of the Next phone calls I got happened to be a gentleman that was in the janitorial supply business, just out of the blue. And so I developed a relationship with him and he gave me, a, I told him my story and he gave me a really good discount 
uh, for about a year. Um, I mm. mean, we're talking close to 50% on anything I needed to buy just because he wanted to help. Wow. Uh, good Christian guy. So all along the way, I, I'm I'm pray, I'm praying like I have uh, no no tomorrow about everything that I did. Uh, every time I turned on my car, making sure I had gas to get to the jobs and things like this. So I think I really and truly learned obedience during that time. I learned humility and patience. I learned uh, while we cannot be prideful during that time, yeah. um, all the lessons that you need to be able to to not just start, but build and succeed in business. Um, I thought I knew them, but I didn't, not at that time, not, not to that depth. You can know something top of mind, but to know it in here, that's what I realized now that I needed to know because I was vulnerable to other storms. I have to know in my heart, in my gut, uh, why I'm here, my, what my purpose is, how yeah. my relationship with God um, should be, what that should look like. Uh, the church I needed to get involved with, uh, the relationships from there that I developed, I was very purposeful about. Uh, I could not allow anybody in my life that was going to introduce negativity. Mm -hmm. That was a struggle. Um, I, I learned that being by yourself is infinitely more important than just having somebody in your life. That's a that's a major weakness for a lot of people, and I'll yeah. say most people. They're not comfortable being alone. I knew that I had to be comfortable being totally alone. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the luxury of being able to develop a lot of uh, friendships at that time anyway. I was so focused on working, eating, sleeping, taking care of my daughter, making sure that I took time to spend with her, uh, going back and forth, 200 mile round trip to, to Greenville um, every week or every two weeks, this kind of thing. And uh, being able to develop a, a safe place for her when she came to visit me. That was uh, a major thing, but um, it was about consistency, persistency, and trusting God. That was the, that was the major three things for me. Yeah. You know, the lesson of daily dependence on God, none of us want to learn that lesson, <laughs> not in an experiential way, but until you actually experience a storm where you require daily dependence on God, you never get the lesson deep in your heart, like you said. Right. And until you get that lesson, you don't have that deep confidence that no matter what storm comes next, God's got you. Right. Like, it's so fascinating. And I think that's why like people are like, why does God let me go through these storms? Because he wants you to get the lesson so that you actually right. trust him and have the confidence and the peace for the future storms in life rather than the anxiety, the stress, and the chronic worrying that you do. Yeah, you just made me think of an interview I saw with John Voight, the actor. Okay. Yeah, And he was at a point in his life where he's literally down on his face, as he says, and he's crying out to God. And he says, God, why does everything have to be so hard? In the same way I heard him say, stand up, get in your car, go back to Atlanta and get in the carpet cleaning business. He hears the voice in his head saying, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed yeah. to be hard. That's the only way we learn these lessons. Uh, we would not choose the lessons to, to, that we have to learn for ourselves. But so God has to do that for us, I think. And he knows what we need. He knows where the direction we need to go. And he needs, he's teaching us all along the way what we need to, to accomplish what he wants us to do. And that was the most important thing for me, not to say, what do I want to do? Uh, what, is, what does God want me to do? And to learn the lessons, I was very willing to learn the lessons. I was like, just, just beat me up. I didn't, at that point, I, I knew I needed it. Mm. You know, maybe you're out there right now, Startup Nation, and you're like, I get that it needs to be hard, but why? Yeah, but why does it need to be hard? The simple answer is because growth requires friction. If there's no friction, if there's no tearing, if there's no shredding, there's no pain, there's no expansion, there's no growth. Right. So growth is a, uh, sorry, pain or friction is a prerequisite to growth. And right. God wants his children to grow. Right. That's that's the reason. All right. Daryl, give us your 
number one marketing strategy after you got back on your feet, you got the money coming in, you got some jobs or whatever, how'd you get to six figures? What were your top three steps or moves? What was your number one marketing strategy to land, mm -hmm. you know, and really grow this? Because a lot of people, they'd be maybe in your situation and they get it to just barely enough to get by in revenue and then hit a glass ceiling. How'd right. you break through that? Wow. Being that I was a real estate investor, I was quite comfortable dealing with real estate agents. And along the way, I'm meeting a few of those. And then I would you know, find out what agency they work for. Basically, what I'm getting at is I didn't have money to put into marketing. Uh, I, I would put out flyers. I'd do small things like that. But I instinctively knew the the uh, the leap up the ladder would be dealing with, with uh, people that could refer me. So I developed relationships with real estate agents, real estate brokers, interior designers, uh, people that were in contact with the type of clients that I needed for my business. So it was totally relationship driven. I didn't spend any money on marketing mm. for, Got for it. probably five years. And how long did it take you to go from that initial client to six figures? That would be three and a half to four years in. Okay. So a right. lot of perseverance and sweat. Yeah. And it's interesting. I had done that and gotten to that point I, and I didn't really realize it. You know, you're working so hard. Yeah. I was unwilling to, to, you know, give yourself the pat on the back because I knew that was dangerous for me. Mm. <laughs> so I just kept working. I was well past that before I realized um, that I had reached that plateau or that level. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it, it took, a, I'm going to say four years, four solid years. And it's, it was, um, it was a bit bittersweet because, but I knew that uh, I could not change the habits that I developed because I think the mistake is we say, okay, now I've made it. Now I can do all these other things. I can develop or take on the bad habits that I mm -hmm. kind of wanted to do along the way. I knew that I needed to to develop that discipline. And once I was at a certain point where I could take my foot off the gas, I just didn't, I just mm. stayed, stayed focused. That's critical, critical, critical startup nation. All right. So what did you do after six figures? You realized, wow, I crossed six figures. That was interesting. Um, you stayed with your habits. What did you do marketing wise to get to seven figures? What was, what's been the number one strategy or do you still don't spend a dime on marketing. No, we, we, we spend money on marketing. It was a little bit later than that. I think it was probably in, uh, let's see, June or so of 2000. So about five years in that I started. Uh, this is when Angie's List was starting to take mm -hmm. hold. And um, I think it, I'm quite confident that I started actually spending money with them out of nothing but guilt, because I think I had done about 60, 50 to 60 thousand dollars uh, in the previous 12 months with Angie's list with not paying them anything because mm. you can be on the list, highly, highly ranked on the list, but you're not advertising with them. And I've met Angie Hicks, the founder of Angie's list a couple of times by this point. Um, and I just felt like it was the right thing to do at that point. I mean, there was a lot of prayer going into that as well, but uh, that was a big pivotal point for me because it really introduced me into more of a high end Angie's list was high end at that time, certainly not now, but uh, that was a big point for me. Interesting tidbit there. My pricing was very low at that time. And I realized that uh, I was missing Angie's list customers, missing some of these high end customers because I was not valuing myself uh, very highly. So when somebody called me from the, from the little bit of marketing that I did with uh, um, whether it's flyers or they're calling me to, to, uh, from a referral, things like that. They were already convinced this is the person I want to do the work. We're just scheduling an appointment. But it was not that way with Angie's List. In the beginning, they're calling, okay, they're feeling you out. They don't know who you are. All they know is you have these reviews on Angie's List. And so it was about a 50% schedule rate. So at some point, I'm like, this is crazy. How am I missing these people? So I kept track of everybody who calls. I still got all those notes. And I started calling them back two weeks later, three weeks later, hey, you called me. Did you get your carpet clean? Why didn't you use me? And they said, unanimously, your prices are so low, we thought you wouldn't do a good job. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, Angie's List wants me to do special pricing for their members. 
I'm going to. I just doubled my prices for them. So I literally just, whatever my current pricing was, if you're calling from Angie's list, list, it was times two. And what did that do for your business? We started scheduling 80 and 90%. We were getting higher and higher end clients. Um, people started to view me a little differently mm -hmm. once I started raising my prices. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important, especially in the service industry, that you have the mindset that um, you can either be a uh, commodity right? You can have the mindset of a commodity that you're, it's like buying eggs. Like, um, you know, I need my carpet cleaned. It's all the same, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, there's 700 carpet cleaning companies in my market, 700 that clean carpet in the five county metro area around Charlotte. Uh, they could literally call anybody, right? But why would they want to call me? What I learned was that people who um, are more high-end oriented, meaning they uh, to me, a high-end client isn't how much money they have. We have billionaire clients that are not high-end clients to me. It's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. Uh, it, it's about people who place a high value on keeping their home clean, and they they want the best service, right? That's a high-end client to me. So I just started um, praying over that. Um, you know, God send me the right clients, make help me to build the right relationships. And fortunately, all along the way, I was I was. Uh, able to do that. I don't give myself any of that credit, by the way. It was it was bizarre, the people that I would meet and the contacts that they would have. But uh, Angie's List played a very important role in the beginning with that and how I handled those Angie's List clients. Uh, today is totally different. Um, I'm not sure how many people listening know that Home Advisor owns Angie's List. And I, I think that right now Google is going after uh, Home Advisor with their uh, Google um, certified program, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that whole market's changing. Uh, I don't. I have the philosophy, I do not want to depend on what Angie's List is doing, what Home Advisor is doing, and what Google's doing. I look at that and view it as a, as a never-ending treadmill mm -hmm. that you cannot get off of. So I'm of the opinion, and I know this to be true through my own business, that you're going to be able to build a solid business that cannot be taken away from you by the whims of social media, by the whims of uh, of marketing companies, you do not want to depend on them. You want to build your own clientele. Uh, email marketing is is big for us. Being able to, in a predictable way, stay in contact with those clients and, uh, and referral sources, no matter what these, um, um, you know, what, what Google does or what Angie's List or the rest of them do. So in other words, you have control of that. Okay, Startup Nation. We've been speaking with Daryl Thomas. He runs the largest... Uh, non-franchise carpet and area rug cleaning company in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. He went from $35 in cash to his name to doing over seven figures a year in his business. And he's been breaking it down and letting us in behind the curtain of how he did it and how instrumental his daily dependence on God was for his business success, for his business success. And you can and should be doing the same thing. All right, Daryl, before we jump into my favorite part of the show, what do you do to strengthen and deepen your faith right now? Well, first thing I did was marry a godly woman. Crucial. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was uh, the most pivotal thing to me. I knew I, ne I needed somebody in my life that was going to, uh, one of my favorite songs is Because You're Mine, I Walk the Line. <laughs> you know, Johnny Cash. Uh, and I, I laugh about that, but I needed, I, you have to have somebody in your life that has the same beliefs that you do, the same way of looking at the world that you do, that has the same goals and dreams and aspirations for life and faith that you do. And, and uh, God talks about being equally yoked for a reason. Uh, if I did not have the life that I do, um, I, let's just say, I, I don't know that I would be able to stay on track as well as I, as I do an amazing woman. That for me was step number one. Um, not allowing myself to become prideful. Uh, uh, I, I find it very important. I, you know, when, when COVID hit and we're doing church online, uh, we had led a, a, a home group for, for many, many years that basically fell apart during COVID because um, people just didn't 
want to do the Zoom thing or they didn't uh, mm -hmm. feel like that it was important enough or maybe they didn't think it was going to last as long as it did and being, not being able to stay connected. But staying connected and being around like-minded believers is probably the most important thing that I do. Um, had had lunch after church with our pastor and things like this, just being able to connect with people that, um, that can keep you grounded, remind you of who you are and whose you are and uh, where you come from and where you're going and the, the plan that God has for your life. It's a big reason I wrote the book. I mean, I, I learn more by doing and teaching than I do by uh, just living it. Um, you know, it's amazing the lessons that we can learn. At some point, I just started writing down the lessons that I was going through. Uh, I, I say on the back cover, it was it was written in real time, and it was. As I'm going through these things, I just started, I don't, didn't really journal. journal. I would just simply make notes and then go back and read those notes and remind myself of the thoughts that I have. And eventually, I realized, hey, this is not just important for me, but it's important for other people as well. And some of the lessons that I had learned, I think I felt like needed to be shared. And so that's that's why I wrote the book. But it's um, uh, mainly to be able to um, uh, first help myself. Then it was my daughter and my family and people beyond that. Mm. All right. We're speaking with Daryl Thomas and Daryl. Welcome to my favorite part of the show. Welcome to the hustle round. I'm going to ask you 10 quick fire questions. You'll have about three seconds to answer each. Don't overthink it. It's just for fun. It's like a game show, but right. you don't get a prize. Are you ready? Yes, sir. What is your favorite thing about owning your own business? I hesitate because you naturally want to say freedom, but it's, it's that I am in somewhat control of my day-to-day -day life. Okay, got it. And what's your least favorite thing about owning your own business? Uh, that you aren't in control of your day-to-day -day life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a facade. It's like, yeah, right. you, we're lying to ourselves. We're lying to God. Like somehow we're in control and he's not. Right. All right. I believe we're all struggling with something at any given moment of our life, which is part of the human condition. What are you currently challenged with right now, either professionally or personally? After 27 years, I'm finally hiring somebody to take over the day-to-day -day duties that I have and just knowing that that's the right person. That's the big issue with my business right now. We've hired them. He's, he's uh, going through that process. And um, yeah, that that's huge for me. Yeah. Just having somebody else to take those things off my plate so I can actually get to what I know I'm supposed to be doing because it's not cleaning carpet. Okay, got it. What are you most afraid of? Wow. Letting people down. Fair enough. What did you spend way too much time doing your first year in business? I, I worked like a crazy person during that time. So I would say relaxing. I didn't spend enough. I spent too much time working, not enough time relaxing. Although, um, the situation called for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a season and the ox was definitely in the ditch and he wasn't crawling out on his own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a time for work and a time for rest. You're in a time of work. Right. What secret fear do you have about other people? Not being able to fully trust them. Hmm. Got it. What do you wish you had learned sooner in business? That there's no real magic pill. It's, uh, it's about some very basic things. And, um, you know, we all, I had someone tell me, I used to work for a congressman a long time ago, and he says, be careful what you're willing to give up to achieve a goal. Mm. What was, if you don't mind me getting personal, what was the most costly thing you've ever given up to achieve a goal in your life? A friendship. Got it. That could sting. Yeah. For sure. Uh, what is a new habit you're going to create this year? Hmm. Um, spending, setting aside more time and more days to spend at least 30 minutes just, just, just listening to God. Um, I, I do that, but not enough, and I need to do more of it. Got it. What's a bad habit you're going to break? Um, cookies and cream ice cream. 
You must know my wife. <laughs> uh, and le- uh, pick three words to describe who you are now. Three words. Dedicated. Um, who I am now. Dedicated is definitely one. Um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. Who am I now? Excited. And I'm, can you, is, is sponge a word? I'm, I'm, I'm at a point taking on something else where it is. I don't know what it is that I don't know. So however you describe that, um, like this, I mean, uh, should I tell them at this point, this is my first podcast, right? You just I, did. I just so willing did. to learn. So yeah, being, being willing to just do what's necessary and set aside the fears and know that God's in control of that too. Yeah. Right? Pick three words to describe who you were your first year in that business, this business. <laughs> um, tired. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't afraid, but let's just say, let's say, let's say humble, tired, humble, and, um, anxious. Hmm. And last question, if you could come back to life after you died, look your family and friends in the eye and give them only one piece of advice about true success in life. What would you say to them? True success in life has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with why you're here and, and achieving God's plan for your life. Amen to that. All right, this is the time of the show, Darrell, where you get to give Startup Nation, my audience, a homework assignment for this week that will move them closer to the desires in their heart that God put there and his plan for their life. What must they do this week? What action must they take? Well, the most important thing for me, and this is the advice I would get, I think you have to know what God wants for you. Uh, we're, we're all given certain talents, abilities, and gifts, and most people, they don't know why they have them. I see people all the time that has that have very obvious talents and abilities that they do not pursue, and we think they're not important, or it's something that uh, that um, people want uh, people want uh, show benefit through, or anything like this. If God's putting something on your heart, I firmly believe that He speaks to us every day, multiple times a day. Uh, I think we just need to listen more, pay attention to what He says, and and then do that. All right, there you have it. Homework assignment, go get it, Startup Nation. Do you enjoy listening to the show? Did you have a great time with Daryl and I today, listening in and taking notes and now about to take action in your business to really make progress where maybe you felt stuck before you started listening to this episode. If you love this episode and you love all the guests I bring on, would you go do me a favor right now and would you write a five-star review on uh, Apple Podcast or on Stitcher or, or your favorite platform or go to first100k.com, first100k.com. You could do it there. And uh, if we like, you know, what you write and you're just a good writer, you know, uh, we may we may give you a live shout out here on the show like I'm about to do with uh, handle Bill Woosley. Bill Woosley, he actually was a guest on the show a while back, and um, I think last year, and he wrote this five-star review. He wrote, wonderful host with great practical information. Uh, Joseph understands the power of allowing faith into all areas of life, business, family, everything, especially for entrepreneurs who run full tilt. Yeah, like Daryl and myself. Not only did I have a great time as a guest, I love to listen to the incredible experts Joseph has on the show. Uh, Very, very well done. Thank you, Bill Woosley, for that five-star review. Startup Nation, go write yours now. Write something kind about Daryl, not me. Please write it about Daryl or my other guests, not me. I'd appreciate that. Uh, Daryl, all right. What's the best way for Startup Nation to get in touch with you or to go pick up your book? Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you got for them, man? Well, it's available totally online, Amazon and all the rest. Uh, my email address is Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L-L at an excellent life dot info. Again, Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L-L at an excellent life dot info. I would love to hear from people. I want to know what you struggle with. I want to know what your, your fears are. I want to know how you, you, uh, what you ask God for, um, 
what you feel like he's calling you to do with your life. And if there's any way I can help with that, believe me, um, I, I want to do that. That's why I wrote the book. All right. Go get your copy of An Excellent Life, if that's the right next step for you. An Excellent Life, uh, written by Daryl Thomas, today's guest on the show. Daryl, uh, what's the website, if you're willing to share it, for your uh, carpet cleaning business? Maybe there's yes. someone in the local area listening that wants to hire you. It's carpetproscharlotte.com. Well, that's pretty simple. Carpetproscharlotte.com. Who's the best in carpet right. in Charlotte? Right there. You got it. All right, Daryl Thomas, thank you for being on your first 100K. I wish you God's love, peace, and joy in your life, sir. Thank you, Joseph. You're amazing, and I, I appreciate it very much.